All right, Frank Culotta, how's it going? I'm doing good, doing real good. That's good, man. Uh, man, you've written some really good books about your life in organized crime. Most recently, your uh, book about being Tony Spilatro's lieutenant. And for the people who don't know who Tony Spilatro was, he was the guy who played Joe Pesci in the movie Casino and also a member of the Chicago Outfit. And your character was played by Frank Vincent in the movie Casino. You guys had, you know, quite a big movie based on your life, about your lives in the outfit role in Vegas, man. Well, I was the consultant in the movie, Casino. Okay. From what I've been told by Nicholas Pelleggi, who wrote the movie, that they could have never done the movie without my input. You had uh, input on certain scenes, right? There were, uh, the whole movie. The whole movie. Anything that went on in that movie was me. Wow. I wrote, I was, that we'd done the script with them and everything. Oh, okay. So the whole movie's about me. What were some things that you... Uh, Not about me, about Tony. Uh, what are some things that you might have changed that they didn't have? Yeah, they're right? cussing. The, you know, they they use different language. I had to correct their language because these guys were from New York, and they don't speak like Chicago. The language is different. And uh, I told them about different episodes that happened. You know, killings, how they were done. They wanted to see violence, violence, how that was done. You know, reenactments oh, okay. and all of that. And I acted in the movie. I did all the hits in the movie. I did all the killing. Okay. Besides being a consultant in the movie. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, let's go back and start in Chicago before we get into your your time in Las Vegas. Uh, you grew up in Chicago. What part of Chicago did you grow up in? Well, I was born and raised around Grand and Ogden. It's on, there's no east side in Chicago, so it would be the northwest side. And that's where I was born and raised. It's uh, We call it the patch. You know, they call it. I never call it the patch. But when I got to be around six, six years old, seven years old, we moved out to the suburbs. Not the suburbs, but close to Elmwood Park. It's a suburb outside of Chicago. And uh, my father owned a home over there, a six-flat apartment building. And this is where uh, my father died when I was eight years old. And we continued living there, my mother, my sister, and I. And my brother, he wasn't born yet. He, my mother was pregnant. And uh, about, I don't know, maybe eight years later, we she sold the apartment building and we bought a house and we moved more in, more a little deeper into the city. Uh, you and Tony were friends since you were 12 years old. How did you guys meet? Well, you know, I never wanted to work or go to school. So my mother says, here, get a shoe box, shoe shine box, go shine shoes. So what I used to do is I used to go on the streets and I, they used to put the paper bags up on the poles. And it was, you throw a nickel in there and you grab a newspaper out, not me. So what I used to do is I go up there, climb the pole to take the nickels out. And then the guy started chasing me. The guy that <coughs> used to put the papers on newspapers. So after that, uh, I started shining shoes. And uh, the street I shined shoes on was, it was, on Grand, it was called Grand Avenue. It's a street that goes east and west, all the way through. And I was shining shoes one day, and I heard a guy yelling to me, you know, this is my territory. At that time, there were streetcars that used to go down the center of the street. So we met in the center of the street, and then he was shorter than me. And we got into this verbal verbal dispute, you know. And he, then he told me if he sees me here tomorrow, he's going to break my fucking head. And I said... You don't own this street. I don't see it. What's your name? And he told me, Splatcho. I said, I don't see your name on a street sign. He said, I'll be back tomorrow. Tomorrow. I said, I'll be back. So I came back for a week straight. I didn't see him with shiny shoes. And then one day I heard my name. Hey! And I heard he was. And we talked a little bit. And then he told me, is your father's name Joe? I said, why are you asking? He said, because my father heard me talking with my brothers about you and this territory that I'm doing with the shoe shining. And he says, find out if that kid's father's name is Joe. He says, if it is, his father saved my life. He says, that means you two got to be friends the rest of your life. And that's how it happened. So you guys' uh, dads knew each other? Yeah. So what, what was the incident that happened? Tony's father, Tony's father owned a restaurant in Chicago. It was called Patsy's. It was an Italian restaurant. 
and he was getting muscled by the black ant. At that time, there was no, there was no uh, Al Capone, there was no syndicate, you know. They just had a bunch of grease balls from Italy, and they were muscling their own people, you know, just like you've seen in the movie The Godfather. The guy, hey, he walked on the street. Right. And this guy was muscling Patsy, Tony's father. And my father was a crook and a, sort of like a wild, you know, he robbed everybody, a wheel man. So he told my father, he said, Joe, you got a lot of problems. So my father said, well, tell me what days these guys come here. He said, I'll be here with my guys. So my father waited in the back room of Patsy's restaurant. And when these two grease balls come in, they took them in the back, Patsy took them in the back room to give them their pay, you know, their payout, their bribe or whatever it was. And that's when my father and his partners come out and kill the guys. And then they sort of eliminated the black hand. Okay. Because they went after the uh, the head of the guy later, right? Later on. They killed him in a motel room. Yeah. He was with his wife in a motel room. Yeah. The head boss, yeah. What were you like in high school? I only went to two weeks of high school. I didn't like high school. I always felt that I was smarter than the teachers and everybody around me. It was too slow for me. So I used to get in fights. Oh, and, okay. uh, so I only lasted two weeks in high school. But I did graduate. Oh. I had to come back to get a diploma. <laughs> I was too old to go to graduate with the regular kids. <laughs> yeah. At least you got it. I mean, you know, that's all that matters. What good is it? You could use it for toilet paper. <laughs> what are you college. doing? You got to go to college to get anything. High school's not. At around 16, uh, I guess Chicago had a lot of bars, and you guys were robbing two or three places a <laughs> night. Uh, one night you guys robbed a place in Cicero, and you had a problem there. Can you take me through that night? Yeah, you know, when we first started out, we, we started out we're sticking up gas stations and sticking up taverns and stuff like that. you got to start somewhere. And we decided to go to Cicero. Now, we didn't know that all the gangsters were owned taverns in Cicero at the time. So there was two other guys, Dickie Richard Garman and Gino Chipetta and myself. Right. So we decided to go to uh, the suburbs, which was be Cicero, Illinois. And we went out there with a stolen car, fictitiously plated, you know, license plates. And uh, probably about a month we had the car. It was a hot car with different license plates on it. So we went out there, we had three pistols and we spotted a, a tavern, a saloon. So I was, they went, I was the driver, the dr wheel man. So Rich, Dickie Garman and, uh, and Gino ran in the tavern. So I'm waiting in the car, just a little ways from the front door, and I hear boom, 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 boom. I said, holy Christ. So I'm waiting, yeah, it's nerve wracking. Then I see my two guys running out of the joint, running to the car. They, one jumps in the back, the other one jumps through the front window, the side window, without opening up the door. And then I hear boom, and the window goes out. The windshield, the back window on the windshield. Mm. Well, the guy that was sitting in the front, Gino, the bullet parted his hair. It went right through his hair. He had hair that was up in the air. And we took off. I thought, he said, I'm hit, I'm hit. I said, if you were hit, you're dead. You would have been dead. So we got out of the area and we switched the plates on the car and we drove back to the Chicago. And then we picked up a rumble, another uh, plain clothes car seen us in Chicago. And they started chasing us. So D R Dickie Garman and Gino jumped in, they were both in the back and they hung out the window and threw a couple of, sh they shot at the cops. And the, they hit the car, I guess the cop car, because the cop car hit the pole. And we got out of there. Well, you got away. Oh yeah. And then never came, never came back. They didn't know where we were. Yeah. Oh, okay. We quit that deal then. <laughs> oh yeah, that's uh, the guy with the the parted yeah, hair. You know, he's up true. He threw. <laughs> Before we go any further, I wanted to talk about your books. You yeah. got you got these two really good, informative books about um, your life and uh, the Chicago outfit, and uh, well, one, one was based on your life, and the other one was based on uh, Tony Spilatro, right? This was based on Tony. Right, right. Uh, the Rise and Fall of a Casino Mobster. These are really good books. Man, what a, 
What inspired you to write these books? What inspires what? What inspired you to write these books? It took me 25 years to write my first book. Mm. I had no plans on writing a book. The only ones that become millionaires writing the books are presidents and congressmen. Right, you don't get right. money, you don't make a lot of money writing books. What was your purpose for doing it? If it wasn't for the I money? just wanted the world to know the real truth behind my life and everybody's life. Lay it out on the table. People hear all this bullshit. These you know these fiction guys. So I laid it out, I laid all the truth out, you know. Around 17 or 18, to Tony told you at a pretty young age he wanted to be part of the outfit. What did you think about all that? Well, you know, Tony always wanted to be a gangster. I didn't want to be a gangster, nor did my father. Probably that's why I got that, you know. I don't want to be a gangster, because then you're controlled by these people. Although I knew them all, you know, I didn't want to be following them. I didn't want orders, I didn't want to take orders. So Tony said to me, he says, you know what I got going against me, Frankie? He says, my height and my age. He says, I'm short and I'm young. He says, but one day I'm going to be the boss in the Chicago outfit, and I want you to be by my side. And I said, thank you, but no thank you. I don't want that to happen. I'll be your friend the rest of your life, but I don't want to be in that organization. He says, all right. Now, I hear a lot of people tell these stories, but I'm telling you, I heard it that was from him to me. So you had a, uh, an armed robbery partner, uh, Crazy Bob Spook. Oh, that was before right? all of that, yeah. That was before? Yeah, that was before the Cicero Tavern. He's the one that got me involved, sticking up joints. Oh, uh, okay. I Crazy mean, Bob, we used to call him Mopey Jesus. Oh, okay, okay. Always carried a gun. Okay, okay. He, he came to you uh, and he had a, he had a beef was some uh, a gang called K Knights it had roughed him no, up. No, it wasn't actually him. It was Dicky Gorman. Oh, okay. He had a fight with these guys, the K Knights. They were a motorcycle gang, and they uh, one of the guys, a couple of them beat him up. So he got a hold of me. He was a good guy. He was. A, he turned out to be a hitman. He wound up being a killer in the end. And he came to me and Tony. And he told us his problem. We said, well, we'll go take care of it with you. So we loaded up the guns, just like a drive-by. So we did no, no, no different than these kids do, are doing nowadays. We went by the front of this place they hung, pulled up in front of the window, and emptied out shotguns and rifles and pistols, then pulled away. Shot a couple guys in there. And okay. they went to the cops and told on us. Well, uh, one day, Tony showed up, and he had a job he wanted you to do with him, and he invited you to rob a bank. That's a pretty big job. How that, that was that was when I was 18 years old. That was when you were 18. You are going to my second book, yeah. 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 I'm kind of back and forth a Hole little bit. Hole in the Wall Gang, yeah. So that's the book, my second book. So he approached me, and uh, he said to me, uh, listen, he says, I got a score with three guys. A score is a robbery, you know, or burglary. He says, uh, you don't know him. And he named one of their names. He didn't name the other two guys. If he did, I forgot their names. I didn't want to know him. I just knew the one guy, Joe Lombardo. He wound up being a boss, Joey, Joey the Clown. He says, and Dickie Gorman and you and I will go. And he told me it was a bank score. And I says, well, what are we going to do, run in there? We need this many guys to stick up a bank? He says, no, we're going to rob the vault. I says, the vault? He says, yeah. And he told me it was in uh, Indiana, Calumet City. So we drive there, all of us in the car, two cars, and we see the bank. He shows me the bank. But there's a vacant building next door to the bank. He says, we'll go in the bank, the building next door. And we'll go in the basement and go through the double wall, the foundation, and go into the bank basement. He says, then we, we'll walk it off to the vault, and then we'll go through the floor, from the basement through the floor into the vault. He says, that's going to take a, two, a day for sure. So we did it. We worked our way through the double foundation, used two cars, six guys, made the bank, opened up all the boxes, the safety deposit boxes, 
dumped them in duffel bags. I mean, I'm 18 years old. It's a lot of fucking work. Couldn't smoke, couldn't piss, couldn't do nothing because it'd leave, you know, evidence, mm. DNA and all. We even thought of DNA back then. The cigarettes, no, no smoking, no urinate, no food. So it took us, man, 15 hours, I guess, a long time. Going through the ceiling was the roughest, you know, through the floor, I should say. You got rebarb, you got to burn that, you know, because it's case hard, you know, all that steel rods. All right. So then we got it all out of there. We, one car carried all the merchandise, six duffel bags loaded with money and jewelry. And we got to the drop, the spot where we we're going to count it. We went to this one guy's house. It was back on the east side of Chicago. We pulled in his garage and walked it through the gangway to the yard. Into the, it was like a three flat. Drug the bags up the stairs. Went in his bedroom. He had the windows boarded up. Counted the money for a day. On a full <coughs> size bed. About a foot high. The jewelry just threw on the floor. 750000 in cash. It was like $10 jillion to me then. At that age, and that that's time, when I learned about the Chicago outfit. I knew they were existed. I knew they were guys. But that's when I learned you had to pay 20% mm -hmm. when you rob someone. I said, what the fuck do I want to pay 20% for? They don't know about this robbery. But that guy, Joe Lombardo, worked for him. He used to run crap games, dice games. He said, I got to tell him. He said, we'll all get killed if you don't pay. So I looked at Tony and said, we got to pay. So everybody paid but one guy. I don't, want, I don't know what happened then, but everybody paid. He just, so I wind up with 50000 plus maybe another twenty five or 30000 for the jewelry. Do you know what kind of money that is back in the 50s? That's a lot like, of it. That's like a couple hundred thousand or mid, half a million. So, you know, I, I like cars. I buy new cars all the time. And it's just $500 tips. I was living like a king. Okay. And so was, that was in the, I was about 18 years old. Was that your biggest score you ever had? Cash-wise, cash-wise. Cash-wise? I made two of the biggest other robberies in Chicago. The biggest robberies in Chicago at the time. Okay. I did, robbed their Mueller building, which is just jeweler building, where all the jewelers have their offices and their jewelry displays. They're wholesalers. We robbed that, Dickie Gorman and me, with information, a tip. This, they beef for 500000 at the time, 60s, early 60s. That's a lot of money, half a million dollars. Wound up getting shit, got fucked on that one, you know, because it's loose jewelry packets, you know what I mean? Mm. And I don't, you know, I, I didn't. You know, I just wanted my money. I was, the information I got, the guy said, yeah, I'll give you this X amount of dollars if you do it. So when you handshake on something, that's what you're going to get. If we would have known there was going to be a, a pouch this big full of diamonds, loose diamonds, you know we would ask for more money. But you make a deal, you make a deal. All right. And then a Brinks truck. I did a Brinks truck later on. Wound up with 660 some thousand dollars. Take me through the take me through that that day. Well, I got filled in on the Brink Struck robbery, and uh, it was the last stop of the day. Actually, there's two Brink Strucks. The last drop of the day, they would go to a rectorium where the priests were. It was set in the cemetery, and that's where they would pick up the last money of the day. And uh, when they they got there, we were all dressed. One of the guys was dressed like a guard, you know. So when the guard come in the rectory to get the bag of money, we took him down with the priest. The already we had the priest, because this is where they lived, the priest. And then the guy went out pretending he was the guard or the cop, and he tapped on the window of the money truck. The guy looked over, seen a hat. He reached over, the two-man truck, two-man. Flipped the door open, put the gun on Took him down. Took him, put the truck in the cemetery with the guy, tied him up, the priest and the other cop were tied up in the church. Emptied the bags of money into a car because we had a guy parked in the lot with a high-powered rifle. 
case this guy resisted, he was going to get one in the, in the head, you know, with the high-powered rifle, the bullets. So uh, took the stuff, went to my house. Another day, it took a whole day to count all that money because it's all mixed dollars, five dollars, twenty dollars change. You know what I mean? Right, right. Takes a long time. Then okay. again, we had to give him twenty percent. Another twenty every time. Twenty, twenty here. How much do you think you? I, have, I never him kept over the counting. Years? I never kept counting. I don't want to get sick. <laughs> the money you're giving away. Uh, so at one point, Tony's you know he's earning a big reputation as being an enforcer, pretty much willing to do anything to anyone who crosses him. And it, at this point, he's getting the attention of the outfit. And uh, he got a position as an enforcer. What would that position entail? He was eager for reputation. He was eager for notoriety. So he, uh, they seen he was uh, an honorable guy. And I'm going to tell you, Tony's claim to fame, and I don't give a fuck what anybody says. I was dealing with two guys. It's a famous murders, two murders. They call it the M&M &M murders. Jimmy Moralia and Billy McCarthy, two M's. I used to steal with these guys. They made the big mistake of killing three people, which they shouldn't have done. What happened? Why'd they kill these people? They had a misunderstanding with them. Two brothers, they run a, a disco. It was a nightclub, let's say. And the guy that owned the property in the building, his name was Paul DeWay to Rica, was the boss of the Chicago outfit from 62 to 72. Our Carter retired. So this Paul, his son-in-law, wanted to open up this nightclub. So Paul owned the property with Paul Rica. So when they did that, the kid hired two people, two brothers to work for him. They were called the Scavo brothers. And this Billy McCarthy had a problem with him. And with this in this problem, they beat the shit out of him. So being that we're stealing together, he come to me, he says, you know what happened? You're gonna come with me and we'll take care of these. I said, Billy, these guys are connected to Rica. You know what kind of fucking problems we're gonna have if we whack these guys? He says, who's gonna know? I said, you had a fight with him. Everybody knows you had a fight with him. He said, well, I'll worry about that, he said. Let me worry about that. They'll, they'll never know you were with me. Jimmy's coming. I went there three times with him to kill the two Scavo brothers. But each time I went, there was a broad with him. I didn't know that one of the Scavo brothers was living with the broad, the one broad. So I passed. I said, I ain't killing no broad. I don't know her. Why should I kill this bro? Right, so I right. passed. The night that they did do it, I was bowling with some broad in a bowling alley. I've been trying to nail her for six months. And he comes in, he said, come on, let's go. I can't go. I said, I'm with this broad. I'm going to nail her tonight. And he said, right, where are the guns? And I told him. So they went and got the guns, and that's the night they killed the Scavo brothers and that broad. Mm. So, so we'll, Tony, to get his notches on his gun to show that he was part of that organization, you know, say a little bit of a suck hole. He said, well, I know my friend, because they know that Billy was having problems with the two Scavo brothers. They put two and two together. So they said, Tony says, well, I know a guy that steals with him. And he'll know for sure. He may have been with them. They said, well, go ahead and talk to him. So Tony came to me by my house, along with my friend, Dickie Garment. And he said, I'm going to ask you something. He says, were you with Billy when you killed the Scavo brothers? I said, I wasn't there. I don't know what you're talking about. He said, well, I defended you. I said, you weren't. They think you were the outfit. He said, I could get you out of this. Just tell me. I didn't do it. I wasn't with him. He kept it up, kept it up. He said, Frankie, they're going to kill you. You got to tell me. I said, all right. They went. I didn't see him do it, but they took the guns. I was with a broad. I got proof of that. He said, I'll see you tomorrow. The next day he's seen me. He's making a phone call to Billy. 
Billy, said, Billy's the other guy, Billy right? McCarthy, the one that killed the Scour brothers. He said, call Billy up. He said, tell him you want to meet him tonight. So I called Billy up on a pay phone, you know. His wife answered. Her name was Betty. She knew my voice. I said, where's Billy? She says, he's in, he's in the other room. She said, I'll get him, Frankie. <coughs> she, Billy comes to the phone. He says, what's up? He says, I got to meet you tonight. I got a good, I got a good score. You can talk on the phones, not Zalvo, you know, on these shitty phones. And he says, where? I said, I'll meet you at the chicken house in Mauro Spark. I was already told to tell him that from Tony. I get off the phone, Tony's standing right there. He said, meet me tonight at 7.30. Bring your work car, the car that Billy knows. So I met him in Howard Johnson. There was a, a motel. He said, meet me in the parking lot. I met him in the parking lot. He was with a guy. His name was Vincent Encero in another work car. Vincent Encero used to work for Joey Ayupa. It was his wheelman, a driver. Joey Ayupa was the boss. This was deep. This is thick. You're talking about heavyweights. So I, I get in the car with Saint. Tony gets in my car and he goes and meets Billy. Billy don't know Tony's coming there, but he parks my car in front of the chicken house. When Billy pulls up, Tony's walking out of the chicken house. Tony had a plan. The other three guys are in a work car. The other hitman with Tony on the side. Tony walks out and Billy says, Hey, Tony, what are you doing here? He said, Well, I seen Frankie Scar. He said, I thought he was in there. He's not in there. See, I was in down the street. So Billy said, Well, fuck it. And he turns around to walk away. Tony grabs him around the neck and they drag him to the car. They brought him to Cicero. Took him in the basement. Tortured him with ice picks. Stuck his head in the fucking vice. This is the one from Casino, right? Yeah. That's the scene from Casino? But his head went in the vice down. Okay. Like face down. Until he said who was with him and the hit. And when he gave up Billy, then they killed Billy. They mm -hmm. killed him both. Put him up both in the same trunk. Uh, around the early 1960s, I think I'm jumping back and forth yeah, on are. some dates, okay. but uh, Tony was on the rise. He's in the process of being made in the Chicago outfit. What, what is, what, what do you have to do? What are some of the things that, you know, somebody has to go through to be Well, just show that, that you're honorable and you're a moneymaker. You're an earner. As long as you can show you earn money, you know, moneymaker, your loyalties, and then, you know, they include you in, in their, say, cult, you know. I never used the term made man. We knew what it was. You know, you're giving it up if you say made man. You know, all the wiretaps, people listening. So we refer to, you know, the guys in the outfit. He's, he's a stash, you know, stash. That means he's a boss, a stash. Oh, okay. That's the terms we used in Chicago. New York, they use a different term. Every, you're different. Every city's different. So uh, as I was going back to the M&Ms, that's what made Tony into a loyal guy. He showed he was honorable. And from then on, Rika liked him, and he put him to work with Mad Sam DiStefano. Okay. Oh, that's I'm not going to go into under? that, but that's was Tony's stepping stone. Tony was the watch Mad Sam. Oh, okay. Did you guys have like a, you know, like for the New York families, they have like the prick your finger and... What? Say what? They, like, like with the New York families, you know, they like, I guess they prick your finger or... Nah, I, do you guys if do they that? did it, I, I never had mine pricked. And I don't remember Tony ever telling me they did it to him. They may have done it in New York and in Italy. You know, maybe they did it when Al Capone was around. But we didn't, I didn't, I never been through a ceremony like that. There was no ceremony or, or anything for uh, it? I can honestly say I never seen it. If there, there may have been, but I, nobody's ever told me about it, and I know them all. All right, all right, right. Burn cards in your hand, all that bullshit. All right, it looks uh, good in Hollywood. Oh, so so you don't uh, think that that's what they do in New York? Maybe they do, but not not in, not in Chicago. As far as I know, it didn't happen in Chicago. Like I said, it plays good in the movies. Oh, okay. All right. At a at one point, you started loan sharking for about a year. What was that like for you? I didn't like it. I didn't like to chase my money around for for five or ten, you know, you get 10% of a, out of it. 
Uh, they, they call it juice, juice money. And I keep five, and I got to kick five back to the bosses. So I got to put my fucking money on the street and only make 5% on it, and they make 5% on my money. Mm. Don't make any sense. So I did it for a year, only because I only put 6000 out. I couldn't wait to get my money back. Right. You know, a guy tells you, oh, I got it, my wife, please. You know, I ain't got it this week, next week. You feel start feeling bad for these guys, you know what I mean? The gambling degenerates there, you know. So they need money. So I, when I got all my money back, I said, I'm done. I told them I ain't doing this shit no more. Oh, okay. So you didn't, do, so you didn't, you didn't like I it? I did it one time it? in Vegas oh, okay. to a doctor. I borrowed him 3000 I knew he was solid. Okay. Uh, 3000 and he paid. Then I give the, I gave the, that deal to my partner, Leo. He said, I don't want to do it no more. I was getting 300 a week. It's nice money, eh? And a 3000 right. I give it with. I don't want to do it no more. I just wanted to, you know, show that we were being responsible that you've been granted immunity to talk about these of things. Of course. Okay. So um, at one point, a maid guy came to you, and he wanted somebody killed. He gave you guys an address and the picture of the guy. Can you take me through that? Well, first of all, I do have immunity from prosecution. So if I talk about murders, it's only because I confessed to them, to the government and the state already. So they gave me immunity. So I'm able to talk about them. I'm not bragging about them. It's something that you shouldn't do. But it's something I've done because I had to do it because I was ordered to do it. If you don't do it and you get an order, they clip you. Right, right. So you got to do what you got to do. But I do have immunity. I want to make that perfectly clear. So now what were you asking me about? I was just going to ask you to take me through the uh, the day. The what? was the car bombing. We, me and another guy, we planted the bomb in his car by his house. He was a union official. And we were told to kill the guy because he wasn't going along with them. Mm. So we went and done it for no money. You don't get paychecks to do that. It makes you, you, you know, know, oh, this is a, what you're doing is getting fame. Right. You're not getting no money. So we've talked about your first book a little bit. And I think we're going to be getting into your second book, uh, The Rise and Fall of a Casino Mobster. That's my third book. That's your third book, okay. So how how many books do you have? You have three books? Three books. Okay, one based on your life? Yeah. One based on yours and Tony's lives. And what's the other one? Based on Tony's life. Of course, I'm in it. Oh, okay, I see, I see. See, I wrote this third book about Tony, more or less. Oh, okay, okay. But I have to be in the book in order to talk about Tony. Right, right, because you can only tell yeah. your point of view of Tony's life. Well, right? what we did together and, you know, stuff like that. What would you say your experience growing up with him all together was? We had a lot of fun. Tony basically was a very gracious guy. He was a generous guy. Unlike in the movie, he didn't swear like that. Every other word out of his mouth wasn't a cuss word. Uh, it was for Tony, first of all. He was all for Tony. And aren't most people all for themselves? Yeah, well, you know. So, tried to growing find up, I used to think, yeah, the guy's all for himself. People. But he was very good to me. We got along very good. Or else I wouldn't have been with him. Tony knew what I was. He knew what I was capable of. He always watched what I did throughout my whole lifetime. He could have been anywhere in the country. He always checked on me to see what I was doing. Always. Yeah. Why? I don't know. In 1971, Tony moves to Vegas, and uh, and you're still in prison at the time. Yeah. What was uh what, what were you in prison for at that time? Multiple multiple robberies. People rolled over and testified. You know, toll on me. Truck hijackings, uh, phony uh, an armed robbery which I didn't commit. I got framed, me and three other guys. We got 15 years for it. Didn't do it. If I'd done it, I'd tell you I'd done it. We got framed by the FBI, through the state. Uh, a, a Brinks truck robbery, that one I told you. We got, after years, that money was long gone. One of the guys rolled because he killed somebody in his score. 
and they he made a deal with the feds, and we all got implicated on this Brinks truck robbery. No killing involved on a Brinks truck, and uh, a truck hijack load. So I wound up with like 36 years, but the but it was a, the state and the federal, so that they combined them, run them concurrently. So the highest sentence I had was 15. So I wound up doing only six calendars on all them years because they were all concurrent. Oh, okay. Well, so that's not bad. Which was like a walk in the park. Yeah. So so when you get out of prison, uh, Tony's in Vegas. Yeah. How did he get that position? Like, how did, uh, you know, what, what made them choose him for that, for that specific because position? Because he was an honorable guy. He... Uh, was loyal to them. They could trust them with the skim. He, uh, they needed to put a man in Vegas. They had a guy in Vegas that went to jail, Marsha Cofano, which was a very good friend of ours. And Marsha went to jail from Vegas, so they needed another guy. So Donnie said, I'll go. Donnie took his family and moved to Vegas to oversee the skim, and he was close with Lefty Rosenthal, who was in charge of the hotels that we controlled out here at that time. The Alpha Control. And you didn't want to go out there at first? No, I had I had a couple of businesses. I owned a property right across the street from Wrigley Field, and I sold that. And then I opened up a big discotheque, sat 200 people. I mean, you could put 200 people in there. I was making a lot of money. And then uh, Tony kept on asking me to move out to Vegas. And I kept on turning him down because I had an excuse. You know, I had my business. He said, uh -huh. I need you, Brahma. He called me Brahma. I need you, Brahma. I could trust you to watch my back. He said, I got other guys working for me. But at least I grew up with you and I know you and I could trust you. He says, I said, Tony, if I move out there, I don't know when. I said, I got to earn. He said, don't worry. I'll make sure that it all works for you. You got to bring some guys out with you. I don't want to meet them. He says, you'll control these guys, but they'll know the orders are coming through me. You give them the orders. I said, all right. So finally, one day, I'm in my disco. And, uh, and Joe Lombardo walks in there. Joey was the acting boss at the time. And he said to me, Congratulations. I shook his hand. I thought I was talking about my giant. I said, thanks, Joe. He said, when are you leaving? I said, leaving for where? He said, I heard you're going to Vegas next week. <laughs> I said, well, I guess I'm going to Vegas. I said, could I go in two weeks? I said, I'm going to sell my end out of her. He said, yeah, two weeks. So I left three weeks later. I drove to Vegas. And that's when I got out there. It was, I think it was 78. Oh, okay. And you, uh, I mean, what did you think of Vegas when you first got there? Well, I know the streets weren't lined with gold. Mm -hmm. Everybody said the streets are lined with gold. And I liked it. It was only 350,000 people out there. But mm -hmm. it could work against you, too. Because the cops, you're the only thing that stands out then. Right. So, and we, you know, it's like living in a fishbowl. You know, they click the yacht anytime they want. Although they didn't have many agents here at the time. When I came out, I think there was only two FBI agents. But then after I got it, they put like 10 or 15 in the office. Oh, okay. They concentrated on us guys. Tony was a big gambler. I think I believe you mentioned. Loved it. Loved the gamble. In your books. What was some of your... Gamble on a cockroach. He didn't care. <laughs> Whatever it was, you gambled. He bet on anything. Anything. Okay. What were, what was some of your favorite times gambling with them? Well, we used to play craps and stuff. And out here, we didn't do that. And he couldn't go into the casinos. But when I first came out here, he could. So we used to go into casinos and play blackjack. And he'd get mad at the dealers. And i get mad at the dealers. We'd throw the cards in their face. But not in the hotels that we were involved with. You know, they'd always beat us. And we'd throw the fucking deck of cards in their face. Not the duck, you know, the hand our hands. Right. So, uh, but he liked the, he had guys working for him that used to play poker for him. 
So he'd just give the money, bankroll them, you know. And that was it. He couldn't oh. go into casinos. Oh, okay. Okay, so he got banned from all the casinos. Well, when you're in that book, you can't go in there because you're in the black book, you can't go in there. And so at this point, you guys are uh, the hall in the wall gang. We didn't give ourselves that name, the cops, the, the newspapers. Oh, okay. They, they would just take pictures of the halls. In the movie, I always wondered about this, man. Uh, Tony was robbing houses, and he would never turn the... Never robbed houses. He never robbed the houses? Okay. That's Hollywood. That's Hollywood. I know. The I thought... guy that Tony portrayed as robbing houses in the movie, the guy that was actually put the pictures down when he seen his victim, that was Leo Gardino. That was my partner in the Hole in the Wall gang uh-huh. and in my restaurant, Leo Gardino. Okay, so that was bur- a thing, though. So the he best did burglar in the world. So you guys are, you know, getting a lot of stuff, and um, this guy, Jerry uh, Listener, comes along, and you didn't really like him. No, I was introduced to him by this guy by the name of Joey DeFranzo. Joey DeFranzo had a nickname. We call him Hound Dog. His brother was Johnny DeFranzo, a boss, and one of the bosses in the Chicago outfit, but Joey lived out there. So Joey introduced me to this clown by the name of Jerry Listener. And Jerry Listener knew that I was connected to Tony Splacho. I didn't like this guy, Jerry. He was a sneaky weasel type of guy. But he approached me with this robbery. That wasn't a robbery. It was a money ripoff uh, for 175000 And he ran it down to me. And I said, it's fucking ridiculous. I said, it's bullshit. It sounds stupid. I says, you mean I'm gonna, we're going to give somebody a, an attache, a suitcase, a briefcase, with, tell them there's 500000 in there, and it's going to be lined with hundreds on top and singles in the middle, and he's not going to check the contents of the bills. Mm. I thought it don't make any sense. He said, where well, we'll do it, it's a flash. We'll do it in Washington, D.C. My brother-in-law is a cop in Washington, D.C., and as soon as we flash it, he'll bust us. He'll bust you and the other guy or me and the other guy, take the briefcase oh, okay. from us. He said, and he's part of the robbery because we'll already have that 175. I said, what the fuck is he buying 500,000 and giving us 175 for, for it? We're gonna tell him, he said, that the money is all marked. And I'm thinking, this guy's dreaming. This is phony. I said, why do you need me on this? He said, because the guy we're gonna do it to is from Florida and his father's a uh, an alpha, a boss, a syndicate guy. And with your name and Tony's name behind me, I ain't going to get no repercussions after this ripoff. Mm. So I says, all right, let me see. So I went and told Tony. I said, you believe this? He said, give it a try. I said, Tony, it's fucking crazy. He said, give it a try. He's got nothing to lose. So I did. We flew to Washington, D.C., we had a room there. The guy never did come up. The guy, I guess the guy figured it out. I guess he was a genius after all. And he said, no, he couldn't make it with the 175. So I got mad at that Jerry. And on the way back, I sort of hollered at him and everything, you know. And then uh, we weren't friends no more. And I told him, you got to pay for that trip. So he had a 5,000 quaaludes. I didn't know what a fucking coil load was. A big bag of pills. I said, give me that bag and we'll call it even. So I took that bag of coil loads, I give it to some guy. I said, give me five dollars a pill. So I make good money on the coil. I said, I'll give you your money, I told him that Jerry. I give him bullshit. I didn't give him none. I run him down the road. Then I found out that uh, Jerry was testifying in front of a federal grand jury in Washington, D.C. How'd you find out? The guy that owned this Villa d'Est was a friend of ours, Joe Pignatelli. It's a Vegas. It's a restaurant in Vegas. It's still there. Under another name now. He, he, the listener's lawyer was in there. He listener just got done testifying. Oh, so okay. they flew back here. And he went to the restaurant to eat, the lawyer. And Jerry went home. So he's eating and he's talking to Joe Pignatelli and he's bragging, he's boasting about his client. So mm. Joe says, who's he testifying on? Who's this guy testifying on? He's some guy by the name of Collada 
at Splacho. Joe acts like he don't know us. Wow. So when the lawyer leaves, Joe calls. He tells Tony, Tony calls me, we meet Joe. We thank Joe Pignatelli. Walk out the restroom, Tony says, you gotta whack him now. I say, yeah, I know. So about three weeks later, I kill him. Can you take but me I had to go night? I had to go to the federal grand jury. First, I got subpoenaed in Washington, D.C. I told Tony, they're gonna subpoena me. I said, you're the target, they ain't gonna subpoena you. So I had to go in front of a federal grand jury, I lied. And uh, they let me go home. So he says, you gotta hurry up, kill this guy now. So I got another guy from Chicago. But didn't one, one guy wanted to go with you, right? But then he ended up, he couldn't go? No, Tony didn't want the one guy to go with me. He didn't want Larry Newman to go with me. Right. I said, why don't you want him to go with me, Tony? He said, you know, the guy's a psycho fucking killer. He'll kill the birds, the dogs, the cats, the kids, the wife. He said, no, don't bring him. Bring another guy. Because Larry was a very dangerous man. So I brought Wayne Metecki. And I killed him. Okay. You don't want to tell the story? It's, the, you can read it in my book. It's be more interesting. Okay. It's a very interesting scene. Right, right. So, so at one hold your imagination. Watch at, it. At one point, he almost gets away from you. Mm -hmm. What would have happened if he would have gotten? He away never from got you? away. Five bullets in the head. He's going to run out of juice. He's going to run out of energy. Which he did. He ran out of his legs, fell out from underneath him. And I was out of bullets. So I went to strangle him and I broke the rope on his neck. The cord had broke on his neck. And then I went to, went to cut his throat, which you have to finish the job. And then my partner came in the house. He heard all the shots. He didn't see me come out. And it's funny, you know, he, he brought more bullets in, believe it or not. He counted the shots. And then he seen 15, 20 minutes, I didn't come out. Something's up. So he come in the house to help me out, I guess. And he had the bullets, I said, because we were going to get rid of that stuff anyway. Right. So I reloaded and shot him and threw him in the pool. All right. What did Tony say about everything after everything was done? Well, we talked in the parking lot with our hands over our mouth. He said, this is the only time we'll talk about it. He said, why the theatrics? Why did you throw him in the pool? I said, DNA. Mm. I said, I got blood all over me, him, the walls. I said, so I wanted to wash it off me. And that's what I did. So in around uh, 1982, you had a fallout with, with Tony. What, what were some of the beginning signs that you seen that, that uh, your relationship was uh, My relationship, not as good? well. Your friendship. Well, friendship was always there, but Tony was... He was very paranoid. He had a lot of heat. He had a lot of problems. He was, you know, his whole world was closing in on him with the cops. And and uh, he wasn't doing the right thing by us guys. And I tolerated him because he was still my friend. And I wasn't thinking of hurting him at all. But he was concerned about me hurting him. I, that was the furthest thing from my mind. And uh, when I got locked up for another case, stolen property, they locked me in a lockup. And then I got a visit the next day from the feds and the one federal guy, and he said, uh, he said, as a, a FBI agent, I got to inform you that there's a contract that in your life. Well, I told him with so many words to get the fuck out of the room. And he says, if I could prove to you that there's a contract on you, are you willing to cooperate? I said, I can't answer that. So I went back down to my cell with the guard, of course. And then they called me back upstairs. And he says, I want you to listen to these recordings. He says, then tell me if you cooperate. So I listened to the recordings, and I heard two voices, Joe Lombardo and Tony. And within the conversation, Joe was challenging him, Tony about me. And Tony says, I can't control the guy. He's a loose cannon, meaning me. 
He says, I can't do nothing. He's got a crew, t bad crew, tough guys. Just the moment he gets out of jail on appeal bond, he said, clean your dirty laundry. So Tony was telling Joe in more or less words that I was robbing and killing people without his orders, without permission, which is a lie. Okay? Yeah. And that was it. So then I, I waited the whole day in the lockup, and then I decided to cooperate. It was very difficult to do. Very, very difficult. It took me 25 years to, to get over it. Yeah. When you're raised the way, it's very hard to become a, a government witness. There's a big difference between a witness and an informant. An informant's a stupid pigeon. He goes around getting information and brings it to cops. I just testified on things that I'd done. I didn't give him any more. Right. So anything I was involved with, I talked about. Now what was the, I mean, what, what were you thinking them nights when you were, uh, you know, after they uh, showed you the, the recording? I was hurt. You know? I was hurt. I was shattered. How could my friend do this to me? Right. It was like my world just fell apart. You got to remember, this is not the way I was raised. All of a sudden, I got nothing. I got nowhere to go but either jail and die. The kid in jail, too, you know. Because I'm in jail don't mean I'm safe. If I'm on the streets, I'm dead, too. They had a long arm, dude. They could get you anywhere they want. That's the way they outfit. Everybody was a killer. Not three, four guys. Everybody could kill. Everybody. And everybody went that, that medal of honor for killing somebody. And that's it, buddy. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about with the books wise? Yeah, I want to talk about this last book and I want to talk about my tours. You have a tour out here in Vegas. Yes, I do. Can you take take a, take the people through what a tour with you would be like? Well, it's uh, called uh, Frank Lada's Casino Map Tour. And it's all about the movie Casino. I sort of like straightening out a lot of facts that were a little screwy in the movie. And I show them all the locations, the robberies, killings. And uh, I do it in my car, my personal vehicle. Uh, I, and if I need more than four people, six people, I could I go rent a bigger vehicle. I have a driver uh, slash security guy with me. And uh, we take him. It's a two plus hour tour. At the end of the tour, we stop, I buy him a pizza, a Q and A, and my driver, my slash security, he sells him books, my books, pictures, autographed pictures. I'm a trip advisor. I got a hundred, I think it's about almost close to 145 stars on trip advisor. That's big, right. that's big. My number to reach me on the tours, is seven oh two six two two zero eight five zero or you could go to my webpage hole in the wall gang dot biz b i z and how how long have you been out here in Vegas doing the tours? I had been had the tours for ten years in a bus. Oh. With working with somebody else. Now I do them privately in my vehicle. I don't put strangers together. If it's a family, uh, okay. you know, like brothers and sisters, husbands and wives, couples that know each other, I put them together in my vehicle. I'm not cheap, I'll tell you right now. If you don't want to spend money, don't call me. You're going to get all the truth when you talk to me and you're going to be with the, one of the last survivors. All right, all right. All right. Is there, is there anything else you'd like to add to it? Now, my three books. This is my final book here. That book is pertaining to Tony Splatcho. It tells you all the killings he'd done. I don't want to talk about it. The book rights have been sold to do a movie on that book. Just read it if you want. It'll tell you everything. Oh, so there's a movie coming. 
supposedly it. That's pretty they, interesting. Because the book rights have been bought. My first book is called Colada, as my name is spelled. The second book is called The Hole in the Wall Gang. It's a takeoff from my first book. I couldn't put all the stories in my first book, so I had to use number two. And this one here is just about Tony. 